Bank of Industry. Yes, this is the first to par Nigeria's industrialization process. Uh, and it's good to just bring you just where they are headquartered this morning, right here in the Federal Capital Territory. Good morning. It's International Women's Day, and it says invest in women, accelerate progress. That's the theme for this year. So, so Bank of Industry, uh, yes, can, can <laughs> take a cue from that and uh, ensure true. that some investments go to our way. <laughs> but it's lovely, all the same. I mean, you get to see all of that. Sometimes you need to look at the bright side of things, actually. So the challenges everywhere you turn. But what is life without hope, right, if I may ask, anyways? Oh, boy, I need to it's say... Not worth living. Life yeah. without hope is not worth living. What is I going to say this morning now? This well, is Lagos. <laughs> Option A. <laughs> Option B. Come on, Chamberlain. Ball is don't, in your court. Don't get jealous. <laughs> this is Lagos. But right now, what you're seeing on your screen is still Abuja. But this is Lagos, the iconic uh, Ikoye link bridge. Once you see this, forget it. You just know it is Lagos. Humidity here in Lagos is at 90% right now. Weather something in the region of 20 degrees, particularly in Ikeja. Excessive heat, you know, is being predicted. So ensure you hydrate appropriately and measurably today. This bridge, of course, uh, just Google it. There's no, there's no two way about it. And Mark, when you talk about the scrap, scrap, scrapers coming on, most certainly, infrastructure is also coming on, and of course, this bridge has saved quite some traffic time for all the people that use it on a daily basis. Good morning. This is Lagos. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Ayo Makinde. And then talk to you about what's going on today. The for ministerial briefing, I think, is the fourth one. The ministerial press briefing hosted by the Minister of Information and National Orientation, uh, Mohammed Idris. But um, I think they're, they're going to have... Remember, the president did sign an executive order in the oil and gas industry trying to make it a go-to place, the place of choice for investments in Africa and then to play a huge role globally. So uh, they're, going, they're going to have some conversation in that regard, in that press briefing. Probably they'll break it down. So all the questions that uh, pressmen have, I think they'll attend to quite a number of them Do you know who their today. guests will be? Yes. Well, I'm trying to... Um... <laughs> You're keeping it under wraps? No, but I think everybody knows it. But uh, she's in the oil and gas sector assisting the president. So she'll be there to explain this policy that's there today. So, um, yeah. Interesting. I mean, this is certainly something that's uh, worth keeping that they have kept from the previous administration. Uh, the ministerial press briefing, uh, where the Minister of Information hosts um, government officials or government representatives from time mm -hmm. to time to give an explainer and take questions extensively uh, from people, from gentlemen of the press. I think this is good, uh, and we, we, we hope to see more of it, maybe make it more frequent so that, you know, and maybe we can also make suggestions from the people that we really want to hear from, mm. as if it's very difficult to get them to come on programs. Maybe they will be more comfortable if they're within government quarters to actually yeah. take on some of those questions, but certainly want to look forward to today. And who knows when we'll eventually see the return of the presidential media chat. Uh, that is one tradition that seems to mm. have died off, um, sadly. It, it, I think the Buhari administration only held like one or two, and, and that was it. Eventually, they granted an exclusive, or they granted a few exclusives to a few media houses, and, and that was it. Uh, but generally, communication wasn't, they weren't exactly big on communication. And we're hoping that this administration, given where we are, will prioritize communication. What the Minister of Information is doing is a good start, but nothing beats hearing from the Commander-in-Chief himself, uh, who needs to speak to his people as often as possible. So a good option um, on uh, International Women's Day, the president's uh, one of the key officials in that oil and gas sector. She will be talking to the people about what's going on in that sector. Something to look forward to, Chamberlain and Mark. Well, particularly, uh, uh, Mark, when you talk about the president, um, that's one thing he did when he was governor. 
every month he held a live radio conversation with the people of Lagos. I'm hoping that such a thing would happen, even if it's quarterly. Dear Mr. President, we know you're busy, but hey, it'll be good to hear from you. And perhaps that will be a, a gift to announce to women on International Women's Day. I'm talking about International Women's Day. That's the focus of Business Morning on Sunrise Daily this morning at 10 o'clock. And what's the focus uh, specifically? International Women's Day 2024, celebrating women in leadership role. That is the focus of Business Morning on Sunrise Daily at 10 o'clock this morning. All right, let's take you through some of the dailies, and we'll start with Vanguard newspaper this morning. Minimum wage, NLC, TUC split, want different pay in zones. So, uh, okay, look at the writers. NLC, TUC, public sector proposals range from 120,000 Naira to 850,000 Naira. South South workers propose 850,000 Naira as governors stay away. Southeast NLC wants 540,000 Naira, TUC 447,000 Naira. Northwest NLC proposes 485,000 Naira as Governor Sean Pali. Wage increase unsustainable without adjustments in national economy. Southwest governors are subscribed to them. And then Governor Eno Diri promised to implement outcome of hearings. So quite a, a lot here to tell you, but uh, don't worry, just hang on a minute on that one. Bandits, I had, yeah. I had at least twice, governors stay away. Was that what I heard? Yeah, they stay away, yeah, after all. Governors, a lot of them did not even pay the minimum wage, even when it was, what, 85? When it was, they didn't pay a lot of those things. And some of them, when it was then raised, uh, some still didn't pay because they thought, well, all fingers are not equal in this case, so why should we pay? But can somebody answer? Do they all receive the same pay across board, all the governors? Who knows? But you've got several other scenarios here. But um, new satellite TV will give Nigerians value for money ascribed to the federal government. That's at the bottom strip. So I, I could, my eye just was fixated on that one. Of course, you could understand why. That's uh, Vanguard for now. So well, The Guardian is focusing on International Women's Day, but paying particular attention to a group of vulnerable women, widows. It's their big story this morning. Widowed by insurgency, gallantry, millions of widows in dire straits over lack of structure, empathy. Uh, that's the lead story on the front page of uh, the Guardian newspapers, millions of widows in dire straits of a lack of structure and physical. When you think about all of the soldiers that we lost, many times, I mean, yes, we are now having women soldiers as well, but if you still look at the figure, at least n more than 90% of those we've lost are usually men, a lot of them married, and they suddenly have left wives and some, in many instances, to children. What is the structure we have in place to support them? And even, I mean, even that's within a structured organization such as the Nigerian Armed Forces or even the police. Um, but outside of that, what do we have for widows in general? What do we have for vulnerable people in general? It's a question we really have to ponder upon. Uh, that's what The Guardian is bringing to the fore this morning. It says Nigeria is home to about 15 million of the world's 258 million widows. Data shows an increasing number of younger widows between the ages of 23 and 40. A little leave it there for the Guardian newspapers. It's one of the most disturbing news one can hear, uh, Mark, where widowed at 23. Gosh. The Business Day newspaper this morning is looking at some, that same International Women's Day issue perhaps in a different light and look at it. Investment in women under spotlight for economic growth. 
That's as per the International Women's Day 2024. That's the lead story of Business Day newspaper this morning. The details are on the front page, continues on page 30. That's Business Day this morning. No Telegraph bandits invade Kaduna School, shoot pupil, abduct 280. Uh, then you see, well, on that trail, ascribed to the police, they will return home unhurt. Governor, angry residents, protest incessant attacks, barricade Kanduna Abuja Expressway. So, not easy times there, I tell you. And then, um, again, blackouts in National Assembly paralyzes legislative other activities. TCN, 60% electricity consumers bypassing meters. That's New Telegraph. Yes, I... Bypassing meters, yeah? Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, they really need to set up a police on that. And, and, the, and the police must not be corrupt. Because you'd be surprised where the, the people who bypass meters, you'd be surprised where they leave the most. This Nigeria has this. Bandits shoot pupils, abduct dozens in Kaduna school attack. Troops defend Sokoto community, kill terrorists, rescue kidnapped victims in Edo, NAF executes airstrikes and insurgent strongholds in Katsina, Zamfara. And stories on page two of the paper, but this very disturbing story broke yesterday. Bandits shooting children, school children, pupils, abduct dozens in Kaduna school attack. A really, really disturbing situation. Um, right there in Kaduna State. I am. The Nigerian Observer is looking at the comments coming from the Minister of uh, Finance and Coordinating Minister of the Economy. Buhari's Naira printing spree to blame for Nigeria's inflation, says money printing not matched with productivity, gives hope on Tinubu's bold, courageous measures. That's the lead story of the Nigerian Observer this morning, and the details on the front page continues on page two. Take a look at Blueprint next. Uh, Obasani to JNI can. We must collectively arrest rising hunger insecurity. That's a big lead right there. Daily Times has this. Bandit. Kidnapped 232 pupils, teachers in Kaduna School. That's a late story on the front page of the Daily Times newspapers this morning. Nigeria News Direct has this one. Minimum wage review. Governors shun public hearings. Well, so if, Malcolm, in case you missed it, that's it. Governors shun public hearings as labor unions differ on proposed hike. Unions peg minimum wage between 850,000 naira and 447,000 naira. All of that detail you will get on page 27 of the paper today. Well, just to highlight uh, this headline and the ones in Vanguard as well on this minimum wage matter. But the one other item here is that since labor is split, and then they're suggesting different things in terms of how to implement this one chances are that at the end of the day they may not exactly move a needle with this kind of scenario so that's the huge concern about all of these things but in terms of what we need to do about minimum wage even though they tell you the law is there for it to be reviewed after a while but it's always observing the breach so um i think it's just about time that probably labor themselves coordinate themselves because look, we, we are, everybody knows if you're divided against yourselves, you, how do you present a common front? And then in the long run, the people will always get the, end, the short end of the stick because after all, if you look through history, all the protests that Labour has had about petrol price, just go there, just check it. What significant gains has there been over time other than just piling up a lot more pressure on the people who you tell them to sit at home, they won't go to work. Just what next? So there has to be that collective decision and approach to some of these things. Because, look, if it's written on the laws and they will not adhere to them, 
I don't know what else one needs to do, how they need to approach it, because it's supposed to be rule of law, and not just that anybody is Williams and Capri. So um, this right here is a major challenge we've got here. Well, if, when you talk about the when you talk about the minimum wage, I remember that when I joined Sunrise Daily many years ago, <laughs> minimum wage was the hot button topic at that time. <laughs> and now, how many years after, it's still, it still a hot, is. Yeah, it still is. The more things change, the more they remain the same. Yeah. Uh, but this morning, one cannot ignore the story. This bandit shoot fulfills abduct dozens in Kaduna school attack. Don't forget that in the last couple of days we have seen people uh, communities come out in <clears throat> protest against what is happening within their communities <clears throat> there have been assurances and reassurances uh, from government officials kaduna state government officials and i think in, in some instances the military too i think it was last week we saw the military trying to pacify a group of protesters uh, who had come out to protest and i think it shut down an expressway yeah. uh, in kaduna this week this week Chamberlain, a week is not even yet over, and now we're seeing that children have been adopted. This is really disturbing. It is sad. It is not the first <clears> time we've seen it, though, but the fact that this keeps happening over and over again uh, shows that it doesn't appear that, yes, I know that you know, efforts are being made, but these kinds of incidences you know, make rubbish of all of the efforts that are being made. And we need to, I mean, how can they take so many children over 200 from what we gather in the report. How is that even possible in broad daylight? I mean, what are the response mechanisms that have been put in place in instances like this? Mm -hmm. I think that we really need to review security around schools. Uh, that cannot be overemphasized, but this is something that, that stands out for me. And maybe one other story uh, about, um, I think it was the body of benches, the chairman of the body of benches telling lawyers not to grant interviews after uh, court sessions, especially wearing their full robes. Um, I don't know how that's going to pan out. I, I guess the, the judges have something in mind. <coughs> Lawyers and the media will certainly have another thing in mind. But um, I think it's something I'll certainly bring up conversation in the following days. Ayo. You know, uh, le let me quickly uh, say we're back to the issue you raised about the abduction of the school children. Depending on which newspaper you're looking at, one says it's more than 200, another says 280, another says 287, uh, 232, you name it, whichever one. Look, 200 and something um, students, it def definitely took some time, and it wasn't like they rehearsed how they were going to get into, they didn't rehearse how they were going to be kidnapped. Someone somewhere planned all of these. It must have taken quite some time. Did they, did they use just one vehicle? I doubt that. I don't know of one vehicle, land vehicle, that can take 200 and something children at a particular time. This goes back to what Senator Oba, Obanikoro said, was it yesterday or the before yesterday, where we hosted him. Well, the, the state governors themselves definitely have something to look at. But I'm interested on the front page, on the story on the front page of the Nigerian Observer this morning, which is about the student's loan scheme. He says, FG explains delay in student loan takeoff sets new date well what we understand was, was supposed to take off in january what well, was supposed to take off october last year i think and then moved to january and now it is march at the end of the day the most important thing that we continue to harp on here is communication 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 we are talking about young people here we all know that they are very generally naturally age appropriately restive so the only way to keep them calm and give them assurances is to talk with them, is to get their buying, get their understanding. The earlier we do these things, the better. We understand that government says they want to get it right. Well, the details are on page three of the Nigerian Observer this morning. We want to get it right. We don't want to make a mistake because we want it to last a very long time. But you are doing it for a particular uh, demographic. You are doing it for a particular public. We should talk to them and not just talk to them. Talk to them through people that they will listen to. There is a magic to communication. There is a science to communication. And I don't think anyone should just sit in an air-conditioned office and expect that people are going to understand once you just put the word out. Let us communicate with them so that we can build trust. That's my take this morning, uh, Chamberlain. 
All right, so that uh, wraps it up then. We will be back in a moment and uh, sink our teeth into some of these items highlighted here today. But we'd like to also hear from you, so stay on with us. My name is Maria Abiodun Lagwaja, and I am the president of the Nigerian Army Officers' Wives Association on this special occasion of International Women's Day 2024. Now, OWA stands united with women all over the world in recognizing and celebrating our incredible achievements, resilience, and strength. International Women's Day is not just a day. It is a powerful movement that goes beyond boundaries, calling for gender equality, inclusion, and the recognition of women's contributions to society. This year's theme, which is Inspire Inclusion, aligns perfectly with the core values of NAOA, and we are delighted to join women all over the world to call for more inclusion for women in the society. To women all over the world, I say, Happy International Women's Day. Do you know that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only, you get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 0913 156 5 Zero one six or zero eight one two seven nine four nine three two three or visit our social media pages. Cast prints, digital printing at super speed. Madonna University, Nigeria, invites you to her Silver Jubilee celebration. It is the first private and Catholic university in Nigeria. As a build-up, it will be hosting the IFCU conference from the 17th to the 19th of March, 2024, at 9 a.m. daily. The grand finale for the Silver Jubilee celebration will hold on the 20th of March, 2024, at 9 a.m. All events will hold at the University Auditorium of Madonna University, Elele, River State. Special guest of honor, His Excellency, President Mola Ahmed, Tinubu, GC. CFR, President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Distinguished Speaker and Guest of Honor, Right Honorable Benjamin Kalu, Deputy Speaker of House of Representative, Keynote Speaker, Most Reverend Matthew Hassan Huka, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Host, Very Reverend Father, Professor EMP, Ede, Founder and Chancellor, Madonna University, Nigeria. Highlights for the event will be book launch, paper presentation, and awards. Madonna University, Nigeria, Silver Jubilee Celebration, a university with a difference. Three in in this era of recovery, ability to engage virtual stakeholders successfully could be a veritable source of sustainable competitive advantage. Embark on a transformative journey with Texam's effective leadership in a distributed world program. Join us from 9th to 23rd March 2024 for a dynamic three-week online experience and a three-day face-to-face session in the UK. This program will be delivered by illustrious Oxford-trained professor Roger Delves, London Business School alumnus Professor Paul Griffith, and Oscar winning ambassador Charles Crawford. Secure 25% early bird discount, pay 2,407,500 Naira for online and 7,864,500 Naira for the UK and online sessions. Achieve, optimize and win with Texum. For more information, email exec at texum.co.uk or call plus 447425883791. Texum. 
Insights that inspire. Actions that change the world. The Duchess International Hospital caters to every aspect of a family's health needs. A one-stop shop for maternity and child health services, emergency medicine and critical care, medical and surgical subspecialties, dental and eye care, and a range of other subspecialties and services all available at a single location right here in the heart of Ikeja. And it really doesn't matter if you're paying out of pocket using your HMO or private insurance. We focus completely on providing that world-class affordable healthcare for all the family at all times. that you can now print all your essential items for events without even having to leave your home? It's the Cast Prints Combo Deal for all events. Yes! Weddings, conferences, birthdays, burials, etc. Starting from 495,000 Naira only, you get 50 invites, 50 A2 size posters, 50 16 page brochures, one large backdrop banner, one roll up banner, 50 jotters with pens, and 50 souvenir carrier bags. Whatever event you're planning, we can adjust to your budget and quantities. Just send your pictures and other information through WhatsApp, and we shall send a design for your approval. Approve your design, and we will produce with super high quality digital print technology. We can even arrange delivery to your location. Call us now on 913 156 or 0812-794-9323 or visit our social media pages. Cast Prints, digital printing at super speed. The worsening food crisis is not the only challenge desirous of urgent intervention, but the unabating insecurity. In a motion of urgent importance, the killing of over 50 persons in at least five communities in Benue State is brought before the House. The situation and development has inflicted on toad hardship on women, children, and elderly who are trekking long distances in search of safe heaven. The humongous amount of money has been allocated. We have not done our constitutional oversight responsibility to ensure that that money is judiciously utilized. You get the same answer. Nothing being done. Why do we have to continue to do the same thing? It's a question for the Senate. We should insist on getting improvements. And of course, uh, constitutional review is coming. I don't know what we can do better, but the security architecture in Nigeria today has failed woefully. And we have said this many times, even in the previous assemblies, that this thing is not working. What we concluded now is most important, to get a team from the Senate and the House of Rep to get audience with the president in the presence of the service chiefs so that we take a decision that will yield result. Many profit solutions before the lawmakers adopted some resolutions to prevent further attacks. Those who are in support of this say aye. Those again say nay. The eyes are... The bill for an act to amend the National Assembly Library Trust Fund to alter the name to National Assembly Library and Resource Center skilled third reading after an exhaustive consideration. Change the name to National Assembly Library and Resource Center streamline the functions of the Governing Council and the Office of the Director General to set up the National Assembly Museum and for Related Matters 2024. Third reading taken.
After the consideration of the report on ethics, code of conduct and public petitions, the Senate also directed the Vice Chancellor of the, of the University of Abuja to reinstate Mr. Igwe Ciprin as a bona fide student after an alleged wrongful rustication and thereafter a written apology. Gloria Umezuke, Channel Television News. Honorable Gwega Isiaka joins this morning. He is the Chairman, House Committee on Student Loans, Scholarships and Higher Education Financing. Good morning. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning, Shabalin. Good morning, Malpe. And uh, good yeah. morning, Nigerians. We'll talk about this in a bit, but I mean, it, it's been a while. I mean, after I think one of the key times was when you tried <laughs> to get the number one seat in Ogun State. So um, what happened? You, you abandoned that and then came... To the house or just keeping your gunpowder dry? <laughs> well, it's still service to the people. The Either whole, way. The whole essence of uh, the governorship phrase was to serve, to serve the people of Ogun State. Now I have opportunity to serve the people of my federal constituency. So it's still along the same line. I mean, what happens yeah. out there after now, you know, that, that time will, will, will determine it. Well, the people certainly need a lot more service, uh, even more so now, because security is huge. It's a big deal. Communities are affected. Businesses are affected, schools, so it's really important. And I know that the House of Reps as well, uh, as the Senate, as we saw in that report, did raise concerns about it. Some of them didn't speak about how they were almost directly affected by security. So this decision about meeting or having an audience with the president, we know that uh, uh, lawmakers also had a session with the service chiefs. It, it clearly shows that maybe they're not satisfied with that, the kind of results they expected. It's not happening yet. Talk to us about that kind of meeting or the intention and what you intend to achieve with that meeting. Well, thank you very much. Um, still the same government. Um, yes, we have three arms of it, um, legislative, executive, and judiciary. But at the end of the day, the day is if everything is to serve you know, 200 million plus people of Nigeria. And I think the, the idea is that having spoken with the you know, service chiefs and all the security heads, uh, both at the, I mean, at uh, both chambers, uh, the Senate, because it was the Senate that passed that yesterday, and I, didn't, I don't, I think I quite agree with that. The Senate felt that, you know, the, the issue should be taken, you know, to the number one citizen of the country, uh, who is actually the one the, the entire security apparatus, you know, report to. Um, there might be certain things that um, we feel that was not, you know, could not be discussed with the um, with the service chiefs, particularly given the forum at which this was discussed. Some of those wants to be taken up, then personal experiences and all of that, so that, um, um, you know, it's just to take the issue, you know, um, to the highest level. And um, I, I think uh, given the level at which insecurity is now in the country, um, it's affecting everything. Um, when well, you talk about inflation, you talk about food, food inflation, you talk about all of this. Mm -hmm. It's all tied to the fact <clears> that, <throat> you know, security has issues there. So I, I so the, the longer shot of it is that um, the issue is just to let the whole country know. And the Mr. President knows that our constituents are concerned, our constituents are worried. Uh, we've talked to the service chiefs. Now we need to talk to Mr. President himself so that, you know, certain things can be... You know, you know a, a number of citizens will... Ex will believe, expect lawmakers to have a lot more information than themselves, even when it comes to security, and they may not be wrong on that one. So what is your own understanding or perception or impression about perhaps what we may be missing, the missing link in our approach to ensuring that we put an end to all of this insecurity? Well, my feeling, my thinking is that it is the intelligence part of the job that we need to do a lot more work, a lot more work on. Because what we have now is attack at, you know, um, very vulnerable areas. The one that happened yesterday was in the primary school around 7, 8 a.m. Even if you say you want, to, you want to secure everywhere, are you going to have security agencies in all the primary schools that we have in the country? But how did it happen that over 200, you know, you know, pupils and teachers were taken away from, you know, a school <clears throat> within the territory of Nigeria, mm -hmm. and the, the intelligence could not pick it. Then how did they move from there out into the bush, out into the forest, and not and the intelligence was not able to, put, you know, mm -hmm. you know, to pick it. So I, I think that um, that is the area that I see 
you know, the, the greatest you know, missing link that I see. Um, criminals will want to will want to do what they want to what they want to do. Mm. Um, there's so much that you know attacks and preventing them can do to it. But how do we prevent it from happening? You know, particularly you, this soft, this soft spot, mm, this soft yeah. area. Do, do you think that <coughs> National Assembly might be kicking themselves now? Because I think it was the eighth or ninth when the bill to have multi-level policing came through, and it didn't just scale through because people thought at that time we need to bring a lot more home, let more people be involved, people who know the terrain. But now they say, look, if they had done that at that time, who knows? You may not be talking about this at this time. Well, is um, I I quite agree with that with you. I mean, I just got into the National Assembly, but even before now, I always believe that we need to bring policing down to the people, to the, you know, down to the communities, um, I mean, through via the state police. But it looks to me now that everybody is not talking about it. Everyone now see the need for it. Um, it's, a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit too, you know, late. I mean, we've lost so much in, in that, but, you know, we can always just take it up now. So I, that is one step that I think can also help intelligence you know, mm. in, in picking some of these things. Because that, to me, is the greatest, is the area that we have the greatest um, challenge in this, in this uh, security apparatus. Well, some people will say, some people have argued that what we need is not state police, but community police. Uh, because they don't want a situation whereby you have state police and more than half of the officers are located maybe in the state capital. Mm. And, you know, the communities, I mean, where they're really, really needed, uh, are left, you know, barren, so to speak. Well, you talked about the failure of intelligence, uh, you know, being one of the biggest problems that we have. Some people will also say, what about response? Because you've asked the question, how did this happen? That 200 children were taken and there was not, uh, you know, there was no intelligence about it. But after it had happened, some people will say, at least we should be able to call somewhere to say such a thing has happened. And maybe the insurgents would have been stopped in their tracks. Uh, but that wasn't the situation. So should we also be looking at the response mechanism of the current uh, force that we have on ground? Definitely. I mean, it's a whole, you know, I just picked that as what I consider to be the most, um, you know, the most essential. Definitely the response to is also something that, um, that, that we need to look at. And that is where the service chiefs and the security apparatus have questions, you know, to also, you know, answer Nigerians. Um, this thing is not just happening now. We were all alive when the ship all gas happened, you know, and a couple of others since that time. So how can another one happen? 200 plus. You say 7 a.m. Yes, yeah, 7, 8 a.m. So how can another one happen? Particularly in an area that these things have been happening. It's not as if they moved another area and nobody expected it. So how did, how did that happen? I mean, that is quite disheartening to, you know, to, to, be, <clears throat> to, be, to be frank with you. So it's, it's, it's one of the things that we need to, <clears throat> excuse me, so I quite, I quite agree. Um, you know, we cannot run away from the fact that our security, um, you know, uh, setup, architecture, they have been doing, you know, a lot that we have been seeing, but a lot more needs to be done. A lot, a lot more needs to be done. Um, we cannot have, you know, children of 10, 12 years going to, this, going to school and from there, they, be, you know, they, be, they, be called, they you know, they end up being in the bushes. Or well, only God knows how long that is going to be. I pray we're able to bring it down, so you know, they bring them, you know, bring them back as soon as possible. So definitely, it's a whole gamut of things. Community policing, uh, state policing. The idea is that let us bring policing down home. That is, the, that, is the, that is the idea. Let us bring it. Let us, let us bring it down. Of course, when it gets to the, into to the states. It is people in the communities that will make up the that will make that will, that, will, that will make it up. I mean, the idea is that if something is happening in my constituency, for instance, you know, in in, in Meko, Aitoro, for instance, I don't want to begin to call Ibabuja before I have answers to it. Let me be able to call at least one hour away or something, and you know, ditto with everywhere that we have any any other part of the country. So I, I mean, and of course, by the time we get to the discussions of it, at, you know, what you call the. I mean, this concept of the of the of the of the of the, of the changes. We'll be able to look at all of this. Yeah. But to me, the idea is that let's bring this thing. Let's devolve power from here. Let's have bring this thing down, you know, down home, so that people that are close to an area can be involved in the security apparatus of the area. Mm, I see the point you're, you're making there <clears throat> about uh, community versus uh, state police. 
Uh, but I, I'm just wondering, as you've rightly pointed out, the fact that this is not the first time this is happening. As a matter of fact, I'm sure if we were to do a chronicle of, you know, how many incidences we've had with regards to children, I'm sure we'll be detailing well over 30 incidents. They're all the same since, pattern. Since, since 2014, uh, which is really disheartening. We've had something like this happen yeah. in Niger State, where children, uh, some of them as, as young as three years old, were abducted from an Islamia school uh, somewhere in Niger State. A, a, a bunch of them were taken from that school, and now it's happening again. So when we look at this kind the repetition, the repetitiveness of these attacks, um, as, 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 a, as now you're a lawmaker, but do you sometimes wonder if we're people who are serious about really staying on top of the issues that affect us? Well, I, I, I think so. We engage them, we engage all the service chiefs, and we can see a, you know, a reasonable level of seriousness and um, wanting to end all this. Is this about you know? the service? I mean, yeah. this is not... Is, sorry, I'm mm. so sorry to interrupt your thoughts, mm. but I'm wondering if this is about the service chiefs or if this is about us putting structures in place that can prevent this sort of attack. Well, well, that is the structure that we have now. We are just now saying that we want to expand the structure to bring in the, you know, people in the communities to it. We are like five years, six years, or even 10 years behind in doing that. Maybe if you have, you know, done that some years ago, maybe when we have the last, um, you know, what they call it now, the conference, and some of these things came up, if that has been implemented, maybe we'll not be where we are now. You know, so we are so many years behind in doing that, because I still feel that that will at least, you know, take care of this. We have the Amotecons, we have all of these, and I mean, all of that, but that is not <clears throat> the same thing as <clears throat> getting some of these people armed and let them know that they are in charge of the security in the area. So the reason why I refer to them is that, that those are the people that we have now. And we have now seen that they don't have all the answers to this. Yeah, they may have some answers. They don't have all the answers, because like you see, like you said, the fact that this is happening repeatedly, almost the same pattern, yeah. tells us that there's failure. So I think there's failure, then that means that there's something wrong, you know, with the... I mean, if you do the same thing several times, you get the same answers. Sometimes so, it looks deliberate. Yeah, you know, you know, so you get the same answers. So, so now we have to be looking at some other options. And thank God that that option is now being discussed everywhere, at the legislature, at the executive, and everywhere it's being discussed. I think that soon and as soon, we should be able to see that coming on board. You know why I'm saying is this is really about the service chiefs? Because, you know, there was, <clears throat> I think it was after that that we set up a fund. Uh, I think then we had the British Prime Minister come hmm. into the country and talk about how the, the safe the schools, schools initiative. Yeah, the safe schools initiative, uh, which was supposed to be an initiative outside of security. You know, have schools fenced, have, you know, a few things just to ensure that at least before anybody just comes in to take children, it's not very easy for that person. That is, that is you yes. know, some obstacles al along the way. And it doesn't appear that we have taken that initiative very seriously by, you know, making sure that at least schools are, are places that, yeah, are secured. So this is uh, as outside of what the military chiefs are supposed to do. That's why I asked that question, do you think we're serious? I mean, if we had initiatives like this that only come up when incidences like this occur, uh, are we really taking ourselves well, seriously? Are, are, I mean, I would, I would like to agree with you on that. Like they say, security is um, everybody's responsibility. Uh, and therefore, the people that are there, the government, I mean, because it is not the security chief that would do this one that you have just said, which is, which is, which is correct. Um, you know, the state, the local government, and all of that will have to do that. Or even the community will, you know, will have to do that. Um, and then to also have so many people, because these people are coming on motorcycle or something to be able to go with. So, so how did they drive or ride, you, you know, know, so many kilometers into that community? And nobody raised, and there was no alarm, there was no response. You know, so you can, see, you can tell that there are so many, if you want to begin to approach our blames, there are so many loopholes that, yes, loop that uh, you know, that are explored. By, by, the, by, the, by, the, by the people. Are, sometimes yeah. we act as if these things are rocket science. They are not that difficult. There are measures that we can take to address these things. And a lot of them are just staring us in the face. But look, we have a number of grounds to cover on this matter before uh, we bring in Ayo, because on this security 
challenge. It's um, there are just so many areas. For instance, for decades we've been talking about this Boko Haram attacks. What have we done as a country to say, listen, the police did not have capability at the time. Let's ensure that we don't overburden the military and ensure police can at least perform certain functions. We did something about police act. Where has it gotten us? It was just on paper. It didn't address the key issues because we're still grappling with some of these things. How many of those cycles we see everywhere even have plate numbers? How many of them are registered? We know in this country, when you at least have some skirmish on the roads, you see how they swarm you. You can't identify anybody. So there are basic things that we need to address, but we're playing the ostrich because we don't want to hurt certain people, and so things keep going this way. But look, I think it's something that we need to talk a lot more. But moving on to some of the other matters before we come in with Ayo, the suspension of rural electrification. Many were shocked and disappointed at uh, what they had heard about corruption going on, with the kinds of persons you saw there, you thought, wait a minute, you, you thought that everybody was supposed to know that, okay, well, it should be business unusual now. But then that announcement came from the president. Is this something that, uh, how did you respond to this when you read this? Uh, well, um, I just felt that <clears throat> they asserted, when, when I read the, the press, president's release yesterday, mm -hmm. well, I didn't hear about the issues before now, until the president I thought now as had of a side function, they should have picked some of these things before now. Well, the, minis the committees that is looking at that might have picked it. And if they are still working on it, they may not have reported it yet on the, on the floor. So we, I mean, I mean, I mean, someone like me may not have known. So I, I only got to know about it when I read the president's speech, which is another. I mean, the idea is that, um, you know, you can't pick everybody all at the same time. But like, let us make examples out of people so that we know that we are serious. I mean, that's what I read there. And from what I read, about it. I think even the security, the um, anti-corruption agencies are, have also been involved and they think they've, they've done a bit of confirmation and, you know, um, collection of some of those money. So I think it's more, more like a confirmed, confirmed case. Mm. And I think the step that was taken by the pres president was apt, you know, was, was in order. Um, it just, it just to set sample. It's not even so much about the amount that is involved, but it's about the fact that this is a wrongdoing so that everybody will be aware that this will not be allowed. I mean, this will not be accepted. Well, your chairman has committee on student loan. I know my colleague did talk about that in the opening sequence, so I'm sure that uh, he's got quite a number. Go ahead, Ayo. Well, thank you. Maybe I should just begin with that particular question of uh, concerning the suspension. Well, I mean, the upcoming student loan scheme has been postponed a number of times, and we've heard government talk from time to time that, you know, we just want to make sure that we get it right. Exactly when is this likely to happen? What are the issues that have been dealt with? Because the students themselves seem to be at a loss, and their parents don't know what exactly is going on concerning the student loan scheme that the federal government promised. Well, the law was signed. The law was signed just um, in June. Um, I mean, the bill rather was signed into law in June last year. I mean, going to like nine months now. I mean, definitely for this kind of humongous um, activities, something that takes care of um, you know student loans all over the country. Um, you know, you need you know you need very solid preparations for it. Um, and I, and I think that is what the the committees that is you know um, doing that is doing that is looking at. I I read the um, release yesterday by the executive secretary, and what I read there was that the part the, the the portal is going to be open this month, um, this you know this this March, so that uh, people that are interested you know can begin to uh, show interest. I I like to believe that um, the postponement that I mentioned about maybe because it has come to an end from what I read yesterday. So I, I think we are there, but, I, but to me, the most important thing is that we need very, is, this is not the first time there was something close to this in 1970, around 1972, it was shut down after about 10 or, or so years. There was the education board that was also, you know, I mean, didn't particularly take off. So now that we are going into this, um, which is something that, you know, is not new to the world since 1951 or so, when the first one debuted in Colombia, you know, so I, I think that all that is being done is to ensure that they, you know, they put the right things in place. Uh, so, and like I said, and like I said, from what I read yesterday, I think um, that wait, we have come to the end of that wait. I expect that um, the students should be hearing from the <clears throat> from the managers of that other fund now.
the House Committee on Student Loans, Scholarships and Higher Education. So you'll be able to tell us whether or not indeed this is the end of the rope because uh, before the law came into being, I'm pretty sure that there were all kinds of uh, considerations made to ensure that you know the law will be uh, e executable, so to speak. So let me assume that I mean that is uh, a given indeed. But allow me to go back this, to the issue. Mm, Perhaps, let, me, let, me, yes. let me say something about that quickly, okay. please. You don't mind. Go ahead. This committee, this committee was set up just last week by Mr. Speaker. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking was, about, just, just a second, I'm talking about yeah. the fact that the law was set up in the first place. Before the law was made, there must have been infrastructure that can run it. Okay, all right. Okay. That's the, that's the I basis assume, of the I, yeah. Okay, fine, I assume so. Don't let me, don't let me argue with you on that. So let's, let's go on. Mm. How about, is there any collaboration with states on concerning this particular issue of uh, student loans? Any role for state well, governments? The well, the funding, the funding is coming from, um, you know, the head room federation account. So definitely the states, the states um, are indirectly involved. And the law also says that it is for all public schools, both that are owned by, by federal and state, um, all tertiary and vocational schools owned by both federal and state, um, and state government. I'm set up by both federal and state government. You know, so, so definitely the state government I mean, all the state governments are already indirectly involved. Um, of course, other things can happen at National Economic Council and all of that in regarding the funding. But the way the funding is structured now um, is, is taken right from the Federation account, uh, and, and therefore, indirectly, all the states are, are involved. From what you know, what are the likely inhibitions in the way? What are the likely challenges that this um, initiative can meet along the way to avert what you said happened in the 70s? Well, typically, if the most important thing, or one of the most important things for this kind of initiatives is the structure. The structure has to be strong so that those people that are targeted are the ones that benefit from it. Um, you know, the law has a, you know, um, a, a benchmark, or, you know, if you, your parents are earning up to a particular level, you are not expected to participate in it. Um, so to be able to capture the, those people that are, actually need it is very, is, you know, is, is very important. Um, also, ability to, you know, um, process applications and get back to the students soon, soon enough is also one of the things. The other one is, um, you, know, you know, collection and, you know, and the level of default as we go on, uh, as go on into it so that it can be a sustainable, um, a sustainable fund. It's also one of the well, it's also one of the one, one of the factors, and and then truthfulness on the part of everybody that is involved, uh, in, you know, in terms of who gets what and all of that. Though, you know, those are some of the factors um, that has affected possibly or negatively this kind of funds in different in different you know jurisdiction. And I like to believe that that is the kind of thing that is being looked at here to make sure that this this starts on a, on a good on a good note. Well, uh, still talking about uh, state governments, uh, permit me to take you back to the issue of security that you were talking about the other time. Gratefully, uh, my colleagues began the conversation with you talking about the fact that you wanted to run as governor of a state. Now, what happened in Kaduna recently is, as you have said, unacceptable. And then there are those who would naturally point to the fact that, okay, so the National Assembly wants to meet the federal government now, the, wants to meet the president now. Every senator that will be in the room with the president in that meeting are representing one state or the other, at least three from each state of the federation. Is there any comment, any responsibility that you think the state governments could have taken? Someone came here twice. People have told us that governors collect quite a significant amount of money for security votes. So one is wondering how such a thing would happen and no one would be able to know anything about it. Taking children, that number of children, almost 300 children, out of a particular school is not something that happens within one minute. They did not rehearse being kidnapped. So exactly what responsibility could the governors have had that perhaps could have staved off this particular it's issue? I didn't get the last part of it. What responsibility does have? What, 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 what responsibility could the state governments have taken that would have averted that, that okay. particular kind of situation? Well, um, you know, the states, a lot of the states 
on their own has also taken initiatives to set up to set up security outfits. And and I think some of these um, have also been giving positive responses and positive results in terms of um, apprehending culprits and apprehending criminals in, in, in your various locations. I think this is some of the things. Um, at the end of the day, the number one you know, objective of, uh, or role or responsibility of, of, of a government at, at any level is to secure the people. Um, I'm, I'm also aware that they are quite, um, by virtue of my closeness to the government in, in, you know, in Ogun State, I'm also, aware, I'm also aware that there are a lot of support being given by state government, even to the Nigerian police and other security you know, op operatives so that um, they can protect the, uh, the territory of the states, as it were. Uh, but I think directly now is you know, to also set up some of these and so that at the locals also even have local intelligence gathering um, you know, uh, you know, people that can give information to the state you know, that can now be given out. Because, like you said, end of the day, all these people live among us, all of these live, you know, live within us. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a concern that that did not happen at all, and we're able to, we're able to, get, you know, able to get this. But let us hope that maybe the issue of the state policing, if they now know that there's a responsibility to, you know, to, to, to manage the security concern in a particular community, maybe then we'll now be able to uh, have more results. Um, a responsibility that it belongs to everybody, you know, probably uh, does not belong to, I mean, it doesn't belong to anybody. But now, if the police, of, you know, if the community police officers in a particular local government knows that it is, if anything happens, they are the ones that are going to be held responsible for what happens there, maybe they will show more concern and more, you know, maybe they will get more results. That is what I hope. But I think the state government has been doing a little bit from, my, from what I have. At least I know of my state of good state. I know they do quite a lot in terms of, you know, in that regards, in the area of and all of those. Do you know, you know, in 2014, when uh, well, Boko Haram started well in 2009, well, in 2014, when they abducted Chibok girls, we had an idea of why they had done it, and we knew what their mission was about. This is 2024. Uh, do we know uh, who these bandits are and what their mission can be? <laughs> I think the, the IG, the Inspector General of Police, that is very deep intelligence information uh, that I honestly don't have. Um, I don't have. The only thing I know is that we have been dissolved in the country. We all grew up in this country. I mean, I served in, I served in, uh, in Joss. Um, I have my friends that served in Kano, in Kano State at that time. At times we leave Joss at about 10 p.m. to go and have, you know, one thing or the other to do in Kano. And I know we, can't, we all cannot do that now, which is disturbing, which is disheartening. Uh, why they are doing it or what is the reason behind it is something that I can't conjure as I sit down here. All right, we need to wrap up. But, I mean, one thing that the authorities should know is that, look, if, when people have their backs against the wall, it was a couple of days ago that the police said they had discovered a local fabrication place in Joss. If you see the AK-47 that they were fabricating, finely crafted locally done. So you can imagine when people feel well, helpless, they resort to those kind of avenues to help themselves. So mm. and that's why the stats came through about millions of light weapons and arms in private hands. So the earlier they recognize all of those things and do something and stop being political about some of these things, it's better for everybody else. Because people have these things just to protect themselves because they lost faith in security apparatus and some government at some point. So if they don't do that, People will fill in the gap. There can never be a void. There has to be something that will fill it. So it's important that we all address this as soon as we can. We well, to thank you for coming on this morning. Honorable Boyga Isiaka, Chairman, House Committee on Student Loans, Scholarships, and Higher, educa higher Education Financing. Thank you for coming on this morning again. Thank you very much, and thank you, um, viewers at home. All right, so business news is up next uh, now, this lovely Friday. Well, it's not just a lovely Friday. It's a special Friday because it's International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to all the women in the world. Beginning, of course, from Nigeria, my own people. We are strong enough to get through anything, and we are going through it. 
and we will come out victorious. Good morning. Welcome to Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. Uh, let's start from business. Uh, I mean, from the global space, doesn't matter what day it is, we have to do business. We need the money and the funding. Well, oil prices rose on Friday, driven by growing demand in the world's biggest consumers, which is the United States and China, while the U.S. Federal Reserve gave a positive signal on the possibility of rate cuts. Brent's crude features were up 0.6%, looking at the numbers right there, at $83. Uh, mid yesterday, in the morning, about this time yesterday, we had it at $83. By intraday, it had gone to $82, but we see it's uh, regained that $83, 45 cents a barrel uh, level. And WTI from the United States is $79, $0.53 a barrel. This is about the same price it was yesterday about this time and that's after it gained 0.7 percent both contracts were down slightly on the week so far however with Brent and WTI down 0.1 percent and 0.5 percent respectively in China imports of crude oil rose 5.1 percent in the first two months of of this year from a year earlier and India's fuel cons consumption increased 5.7 percent in February on the year I mean, strong factory activity uh, in that country, which is the world's biggest oil importer and consumer. Still staying in the global space now, Chicago wheat inched high on Friday with short covering supporting prices after recent declines. Although the market is on track for a second week of losses on the demand, on the lack of demand and plentiful global supplies. Corn is poised for a third week of gains, while soybeans are up for a second week and positioning ahead of a monthly supply demand data, which is due later on uh, today from the United States Department of Agriculture. Now, looking at the prices, soybeans, we see their gains 0.3% at $11.70 for a quarter of a bushel. Well, we've seen soybeans around this price, at least for this week, about $11, even though, you know, the cents uh, have been moving quite a bit all through the week and then for the Chicago contracts on the Chicago Board of Trade added 0.1 percent to five dollars uh, a bushel for corn we saw that was on the flip side it lost 0.3 percent there you have it to drop to four dollars 36 cents for a bushel uh, soybeans we already told you about eleven dollars eleven dollars seventy cents now for the week wheat has lost around five percent corn gained about three percent and soybeans gained about 1.5 percent this is an important uh, mover in the market today. China cancelled its purchases of 130,000 metric tons of U.S. soft red winter wheat. Uh, 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 this was released by the USDA after prices dropped since uh, Chinese importers went on a buying spree last year. We know they accumulated a whole lot from Russia, remember, cheap grain came uh, and is still coming from that country even now. Egypt state grains buyer, the General Authority for Supply Commodities, cancelled that international tender for wheat that had a deadline for offers of March the 7th. They cancelled yesterday. That's Egypt apart from China. Then global wheat buyers are booking cargoes for immediate needs, buying just one or two months in advance on expectations of bumper northern hemisphere harvest in the second half of the year. And then we come back home to Nigeria where we have a little bit of relief, according to the central bank, uh, the regulator has reported a significant increase in foreign exchange inflow into the economy in the past month. That's February, uh, with marked increment in uh, remittances payment by Nigerians overseas and purchases of Naira assets by foreign portfolio. Yes, so in the uh, fixed income market, we did see that the securities offered between last week and the and this week, about 75% of that was by foreign portfolios. So that's part of what the CBN is saying. Uh, now, this was released in a statement shared with newsmen uh, by the bank's acting director of corporate communications, Mrs. Hakama Sidi Ali. Uh, she said that the bank's data indicates that overseas remittances rose to $1.3 billion in February, uh, more than four times what was uh, recorded in January. That, that was about $300 million. Uh, uh, dollars. Foreign investors purchased more than $1 billion of Nigerian assets last month with total portfolio flows of at least 
2.3 billion recorded thus far in 2024 compared to 3.9 billion seen in total of last year. She said higher FX inflows continued in March, driven by increased investor interest in short-term foreign debt following the recent adjustment to benchmark interest rates. She also notes that the government securities issuances have been significantly oversubscribed with foreign um, investors accounting for over 75 percent bid for that. So perhaps we're going somewhere once we have continuous inflow of FX into the country. FDI is always better, but we can, we can make do with FPI at this time. I guess that would also put a little bit of ease on the Naira. Talking about the Naira, uh, let's look at what it closed with yesterday. Uh, on the NAFEX, it depreciated slightly by 2 Naira 65 Kobo to close at 1,611 Naira. There you have it. Uh, that's for NAFEX. Uh, 1,608 for NAFEX. For NAFEM, six, um, I'm beg your pardon, this is what it's opened with and this is what it closed with. For NAFEX, 1,611 Naira, 14 Kobo. For NAFEM, 1,602 Naira, 17 Kobo. These figures are from Access Bank. Uh, we know one of the banks that uh, are allowed to do that. So um, this is what the market will open with, at least on the official market. Uh, we'll see what it will close with. So it was a, a drop for NAFEM. Uh, and a steady for NAFEX uh, for the Naira at the close of trade. But, I mean, not looking very good because we are now back to 1,600, at least on the official market. Even even in the black market and the parallel market, is about 1,006. So we're hoping we'll be able to steady 1,500 and all of that. But so we haven't been there yet, or we haven't gotten there yet. We hope to get there very soon. Now, let's celebrate today. We're celebrating the women today all over the world. For this morning, let's look at uh, the women in the private sector, how they are coping the competition, especially in the male-dominated uh, sectors, ICT, for instance. So today, March the 8th, the World Marks International Women's Day, a day to renew collective commitment to achieving gender equality. This year, the theme is invest in women to accelerate Progress, you know, they say educate a woman, you educate a, a nation. Well, let's speak to the group managing director of Champs PLC, Mrs. Mayowa Olanio. As she joins us, uh, busy shadow couldn't be here in person, unfortunately. But we celebrate this woman who is the first female group managing director of that company, Ms. Olanio. Good morning and good to have you on the show. Happy International Women's Day. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Yeah. This so, morning. I guess I should also say congratulations also. Last year, 2023, uh, your company was the second best performing at the NGX. But good enough, even the best performing was also led by a woman. It's also led by a right. woman. That trans cause. So, I mean, I think we're breaking <laughs> boundaries everywhere. But this conversation... Yes, yeah. <laughs> This conversation of uh, equality, uh, gender equality, uh, have we gone beyond the talking to the doing in Nigeria? Has the narrative changed in recent times? Thank you so much. Once again, good morning and thank you for having me. Yes, of course, we've gone beyond the narratives in Nigeria. A lot has been done, but there's still need for us to accelerate the progress. I align with the teams of this year's uh, International Women's Day. We have achieved a lot, but we are not where we ought to be yet. There's still a lot of area where we need the women, the girls to participate very well. I know ICT today, we have a lot of techy ladies, but there's still a lot of fighting land to be cultivated in that area, where in which we need to encourage our ladies our women invest in them to bring them up to speech, inspire them, instill confidence in them, mentoring them, and bring them up to occupy the right position. So share with us your experience. Uh, you're in the ICT. You are the first group managing director of your company. In ICT, which we know is mostly you know, male-dominated, how did you get to this position? How easy or difficult what is, uh, was it? And how easy or difficult is it running this group of companies with a lot of men, I presume, around you? 
Thank you so much. Of course, when I came in, we have very few ladies within the system. We have to work together with a lot of men. But passion counts. Determination is important. When you are working with opposite set and you want to make an impact, so we work, but good enough. Champs environment is a value-driven environment where everyone is recognized equally. That actually counted for me. It is a place where gender is not really an issue, but notwithstanding, as a woman in an industry where you have a lot of them as men, population about 90% as men, you need to work hard to do extra work for you to be able to establish your footprint in that place. That is what can take. It's not that there won't be some challenges. Yes, I recognize challenges. But for my person, I dare challenge a lot because I like to learn new things. That actually help. I believe that if men can code, probably the women can do better. Even the men can do a lot more that are free. We have a lot of successful tech ladies. And I look at them as mentors. I work with some of them and I was able to climb up the ladder. And in managing the organization, as we all know, women actually stand to be the best administrators. So when I came in, I have to do a little bit of restructuring within the system strategy and be properly focused as a woman to bring some people up. I want to say kudos to Wimbis, one of the people that visited that we discussed and how we could align and a lot of their suggestions were implemented. And I could see how it paid, it paid chance, and today we're reaping the dividends of that in the organization. Mm. But more importantly, I would say that we need to upscale a lot of women in this industry. We need to mentor some of them. Networking is important. As I said, I leverage a lot of women. Networking is important. In for proper positioning and to be able to take advantage of opportunity when it presents itself. This helps a lot in performance and uh, in performance in order to establish us in the proper position. Positioning is very key. I work on that a lot, a lot as in a lot. I have some mentors in the industry that are women that, are help, that helps on that. And I was able to position myself as well, position the organization. Mm, thank thank you. you. Thank you for sharing those tips. But now let's look at the theme for the year, investing in women. When you look around you, even outside your industry, the ICT, um, what areas do you think investing in women should be prioritized? And what level of women do you think should be first given focus at this time in Nigeria? Thank you so much. Investing in women is investing in a nation. Quite all right. Because women give a lot of value. But for now, what area do we need to prioritize? We know one, I, I, I will say in technology, startup is key for us to prioritize and support women to start up their own business. We have a lot of them at management level. They are managing, but they can do a lot better. If you are able to transit like a Juliette Human, the former Google directors, the founder of Beyond the Limits, if you can have a number of that, the like of uh, Damilola Oloke Susi, a, lo a lot of that in the industry, develop their skill, entrepreneurial skill, beyond working, beyond managing the organization. Let them be able to start their own business support them, invest in them, invest in their startup. Apparently, women actually, the organizations that are led by women are more profitable most often than that of their counterpart. If we invest in them and support them, they will be able to bring in up a lot of women that will attain that level as well. As I mentioned, that I leverage on other women that are the top, that groom me, that mentor me, that supported me to attain this feat. So if we have a lot of women being supported to start their own organization and 
able to employ others and mentor others as well, I think we will accelerate the progress as we desire. Mm. What about from home now? Um, let's look at the traditional cultural myths that we have, especially in Africa, you know, we did hear that the woman belongs to the kitchen and all of that. Um, how far away are we from those traditional myths at this time? Are parents helping or do parents still have that mindset that, well, when you get to the home, it's the woman that should, you know, take care of the domestics and forgetting the talent, you know, that the young girl might have in, he, in her. Thank you so much for that crucial point. Unfortunately, some still have that mentality. But the fact of the matter is that home is a joint responsibility. Home is a joint responsibility for both men and women. Yes, women could be the, a kind of director to manage the home, but it's not as safe the talent of the women to be buried in the kitchen, not at all. In this time now, we have a lot of supporting arms you can get at home to support while you direct and you coordinate what they do. But it's not as if to spend this precious time in the kitchen. What we suggest, I would like to recommend is that to get the appropriate support at home, to jointly be monitored or managed by both man and the woman at home, rather than a woman spending their time in the kitchen. What is required is to get adequate support at home for them to be able to free their time in creating value and developing the economy and country at large. Finally, we'd like for you to share some tips. You know, this day we talk about work-life balance, especially for women. Um, naturally, a woman has that desire to have her family, to take care of her family. And some part of your years, you know, is you give more attention to that. Maybe when the children grow up and all of that. But share with us from your perspective some tips for work-life balance for a woman to grow both at home and in her career. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is another important, important topic, and the woman needs to take heed of because of enormous tax that actually the woman needs to handle. They tend to walk from the office to home, but it's important for its sake and for a lot of reason for us to live a life balance, work-life balance. What are the things we need to do? What matter, number one, is planning. Planning, planning, and planning. Even in the office, if you don't plan, you tend to do all the works. And before you know, you will wear out and objective will not be achieved. So you plan and you delegate. Having proper people to support you in the office will help you to free some time for you to stay back, review your work, and relax as well. This is the same thing we need to replicate at home fronts as well. Even when you are at the teaching stage where you have to attend to the kids at their early stage as well. As I said earlier, support is important. Getting, get a support that can give you comfort and delegate. Let your role become a perpetual role at home and office. In, in such a way that you would be able to see every aspect of things that are being done at home. And that will enable you to relax and be able to take your time to support as well. Again, the counterparts, the men, the father in the house has important role to play in this. It, I, I would suggest, like I did, I have a timetable and I have a roster in my own house. That can be adopted to know when you are meant to stop, when you are meant to rest, when you are meant to take, even though when you are at home, when you are meant to take a leave, a time to rest in your inner room, all this can be outlined and you will follow it. If your partner is the type that is considerate and understand, it, can, it will support you to be able to take some time off, even the house, to be able to rest. 
And that's why we say, don't negotiate your leave. Even at home, in the office, they are the time to rest. So if you have plan and you delegate and you follow the time, your plan, your timetable through, you will be able to rest at operate at appropriate time. This will help you to live a work-life balance. Thank you so much, Ms. Solani. If I didn't hear anything you said, I heard having a timetable and following through with that timetable. I'm sure a lot of people will say, oh, why didn't I think of this? Or a lot of people are already practicing that. But thank you so much. Group Managing <laughs> Director of Charms PLC, uh, Ms. Solani. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, so it's still celebrating the women uh, today, the 8th, uh, March the 8th uh, for 2024. We're looking at empowering the women, investing in the women. And uh, it, it's a daily thing. It's not once in a year thing. It's a daily thing. And some tips there shared by the Group Managing Director of Champs PLC. If you want to have a balanced office, a career, and, and home life for a woman, it could be demanding. We've got the power. All right, so let's go to the market now. Thankfully, the market, the NGX, was up yesterday. The NGX went back to that 100,000 level. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> I guess you can say that's the good news for a day like this. Yes, we regained uh, that yesterday um, to the joy of a lot of investors. Looking at the numbers right there, the NGX went back up to 100,335.30. Equity cap uh, was uh, added 440 billion naira to the market cap yesterday uh, and uh, back to 56 trillion naira, 56.730 trillion naira. And the activity uh, chart yesterday was mixed, but more of green. Uh, volume was up. More than 33% value uh, dropped. That's the red that we have there. Our deals increased by just about 4%. Looking at the sectors, the figures did not make it through yesterday. Profit taking is still on that. That means it's still an opportunity for investors to jump on, uh, on that uh, sector if that's your area of interest. Consumer good, however, was up 0.62%. Industrial good, very slight, almost uh, uh, negligible, uh, we see right there. Insurance was also up. And we saw that the market mover yesterday was MTN, MTN Nigeria. Well, uh, it might not be profit for a lot of investors in that stock because we know that it dropped even from about 200 to 185. Uh, yesterday, it opened at 185 and went up to about 200 again, but it has not regained its former uh, level, price level. So perhaps you're not making profit, but it shows that, I mean, a stock is coming back up. Investors are picking up interest again, and it might very soon uh, give you that profit that you've been waiting for. Top trades for yesterday. Transcore. Since that listing of Transcore Power, we've seen Transcore, the parent body and the power that was just listed. Uh, it's been surging, catching a lot of attention. I hope it's still open to investors. Uh, Sterling NG was also a part of the top trade yesterday. Um, FBN Holding also, we see, gained yesterday 23.21 million naira. So top trades we see uh, for yesterday. One of those uh, that will move the market today. Let's go to the unlisted market, the smaller unlisted market, uh, NESD. We saw that uh, the market was down 1.71% at 1.063. And the market cap, uh, yeah, so it was down. Market cap was 1.442 trillion naira from the listed market. A lot of greens when we look at the activity charts for that market yesterday. Stocks traded were five, deals were five. I saw the only red yesterday was in the volume. Uh, more than 79% drop in the volume of yesterday. The fixed income market was, uh, well kind of busy, we know, as we saw in that uh, data from the CBN, that uh, some foreign investors are picking up interest in the fixed income market. So we've had a series of auctions. We had one yesterday. We'll probably see the results by tomorrow. And uh, we see that about 75%, according to CBN, about 75% uh, uh, of 
the purchase there uh, was by foreign investors. So that means some foreign exchange into the country, uh, which is what we are looking for to help surge. Uh, Buffer the value of the Naira. Treasury bills witness bearish sentiment. Uh, when we look at, there you have it. We had quite a, lot, a number of deals yesterday, 240, as I said, that auction. And we see foreign investors coming back to the market. Well, of course, that has a positive side. It's what we want. They come with a foreign currency, and that helps our reserve, helps our Naira. But we know these are portfolio investors, and so we need to be careful in our uh, optimism right there because these are portfolio guys. They can just sell and leave the market at any time. But yesterday, they brought about 399.57 billion Naira, the total value for yesterday in the market, and we see that it's the March 25th. Uh, remember that data also, it's the short security, the short-term securities that the foreign investors are more interested in. Uh, that's why it's just portfolio, so they can up out at any time. So it's the short security that we see making, uh, catching a lot of interest. So we see the March 20, 20, 2025 there uh, had 214 deals off the 249. So you can imagine. Let's look at the bonds. The federal government bond. It opened quietly with minimal activities in the early hours. Uh, there were pockets of demand in the mid to long dated uh, maturities. So eventually there were 35 deals worth 34 billion naira for the for federal government bonds of yesterday. The most active was the February 2034 uh, security uh, for yesterday. We see the, that the, it had 15 deals of these 35 uh, deals right there. By close of trading, average yield across the bench, mark bonds remain relatively unchanged from opening levels. Uh, is expected that would be weak sentiment today also. But um, it's a fiery market. We see foreign investors are coming back to Nigeria's market. I wish the domestic investors would do more, but we do, know, we do need that foreign currency, so we welcome them. And the yields are going up. Yesterday, I believe the yield went up as much as 25%. That's really close to um, the inflation rate, which is what a lot of investors look at. If I put my money here and inflation is at 29%, by the time I'm getting it out, am I making more money or actually losing value? So the closer it gets to the inflation rate, the better for us and the more investors that we get. So, we'll be bringing you more, of course, at 1.30. Do join me again uh, for Business Incorporated. We'll get more on the markets, more on the women. We're celebrating women around the world. You don't want to miss it, I promise you. But let's head back to the Sunrise Daily Studio. You know how it is when it's, a, when it's International Women's Day. Then they remember that there's a woman in the team who should be taking the lead. Well, what's well, your number? I'm not going to shy away hey. from it, Chimbley. <laughs> and I'm really <laughs> delighted to be making this introduction um, of our next guest. She is Dr. Blessing Enakimo. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Blay Global and Director of Events Brevity Anderson. She joins us via Zoom from Kent in the United Kingdom. Good morning, Dr. Nakimo. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, welcome to Sunrise Daily and happy International Women's Day. Happy International Women's Day to you too. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm looking at this year's theme and I'm uh, looking at all that you two have done over the years. Uh, this year's theme is Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. For you and where you stand, how does how do you connect with this theme? It's an exciting theme, I think, and it's it's good to see a positive recognition in the theme for once um, on International Women's Day. For me, I think it's it's the truth in it that says invest in women, accelerate progress. Because the truth is, if you do want to accelerate progress in any any industry in any nation, 
the key is to invest in women. And I'm glad that the United Nations has recognized that. So for me, I'm glad and I stand with it. How have you been able to connect with this? I mean, you say that this is something that is a truth. I'm sure you're saying this from perhaps personal experience. Can you share with us some insights into how you come to the conclusion that this is in fact a truth? Thank you for that. I, I personally believe that when you invest in a girl, she becomes the woman that will change the next generation. When you look back in history and you see the changes that have been made, you would recognize this fact and, and agree that for every change that has taken place, women have been pivotal in, in these changes. For me, in my journey, I suppose, a lot of what I do as an event designer or as a business strategist, sometimes I find myself in a man's world. So the question is, do I come in and pretend to be masculine or do I come with my femininity to, to ask for a seat at the table? And I've found that over time, you, you, if you do seek and ask for a seat at the table, you could be slighted. So I think by investing in yourself, so when you say invest in women, I would address that instruction to women. So I stand for investing in myself and my, my mantra is for women to invest in women. So women to women, women to girls. And I found that over time in, in various sectors that I work in, there's been a rise in female leadership. There's been presence of women. You can see them at the forefront making changes and changing policy, changing direction. There's a lot that has taken place as a result of women being present and coming with their whole self with all that they are as women. So I, I personally agree and would continue to advocate for women to women, women to girls. Let's enable ourselves as women to make sure that the change we seek comes from us. I believe in the power of one. If you want to see a change, you should be the change. And, and in my world, I have done that, I suppose. Indeed. Well, I, you certainly can say that again, the power of one. And, you know, if you want to, you know, see change, be that change which you desire. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the theme on broad terms, and you, I, I cannot get over the fact that you say this is, in fact, a truth. Um, hmm. and so you have to ask questions as to how come it is that, you know, something that is so obvious, something that we have seen work in many places. I think some people say you cannot clap with one hand. Yeah. Or the fact that, you know, you cannot, if women and men, you know, together make 100% of the population and you have roughly half of them of one sex, how do you really, how does any society hope to make progress when you consistently invest in just one half? And we've seen how when, you know, both halves are invested here in the progress that we, we make in those places. Uh, so you have to ask, why is it that, you know, obstacles still stand in the way of governments, uh, you know, and, you know, communities in investing in this other half in such a way that we can leapfrog progress. Why has it been so difficult in your own estimation? I think to, the, the truth is to change any conversation, you have to change the narrative. If the story is continued to be told by men, it's going to have a male perspective. So if we get to the point where women are in the position to be the ones telling the story, the narrative would change. So, uh, for instance, this session, if, it were, if I was being interviewed by a man, the conversation would be different. But because you're a woman, the conversation is going to be directed in a certain way. So if you look at these areas across the nation that we're talking about, if it's still fully led by men or women are still in the minority, you don't need to guess, you know, what the narrative is going to be like. So I think for the change to occur and to be sustained, it's not just a case of ticking the box because the SDG say we should include women or there, there should be diversity or there should be inclusion. It should be a little bit more than that. It should be for women to rise to those positions where they are the ones telling the story, where they are the ones making the decisions, because only then would there be some sort of equity, some sort of equality, some sort of a balance. But until then, it's still going to be a man's story. It's still going to be, oh, let's just, let's just, let's just make sure there's a woman in the picture. You know, but we, we've gone past that. So I think 
it, it, for us as women as well, when you are seeking that space, when you're going into a new world, it's important to do your research, do your due diligence, understand where you're going into. What are the rules of engagement here? And don't just expect that, oh, because I'm a woman and they require women to be there, I, I qualify. No, understand what the rules of engagement are. Develop yourself to that point where you are speaking on authority, not because you're a woman, but because of your merits, because of your background, your expertise, you know what you're talking about. And I think on such a time as that is the norm, we will continue to have this conversation. And it's interesting that, you know, when you look at this theme, it speaks to, you know, different levels of women. I, I'm sure largely wow. now when you, you, you're speaking, I'm sure you're also thinking of many women such as yourself uh, who have had the opportunity to have an education, you know, wow. and, and even operate in... Uh, will I say, in many um, privileged spaces of the corporate mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you go down the ladder, when you talk about women or young people in the primary schools, secondary schools, mm -hmm. the fact that some never get an education, the fact that mm -hmm. some at some point have to, you know, the education is truncated, or that some people still mm -hmm. do not see the value of, mm -hmm. having, um, of having women educated. Or, you know, some... Cultures still think that it is okay for women to be married off really young because that's what we are meant for. Um, it, it, it does appear that there is no cater, there is no strata which you apply this theme that it will not be relevant. Uh, I'm just looking at you know the different strata. When you when you look, look at it like that, where would you like us to apply this theme a lot more? Investing in women. You're so right. You are on point to the max. Let's take it down to the girl child. Let's educate the girl child. I think if we can do that in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, in, in 30 years' time, there will be a massive difference. I mean, I've, I've traveled around and I go to countries, say, for instance, in Arab countries, say, in the UAE, in Egypt. There's a lot being done for women and their education. There's a lot, there's a, a whole emphasis, a national emphasis on women ed being educated, on girls being educated. And you see the shift, you see the difference. Because of that, on that level, from that primary school level where women and girls are given the chance, you'd see that in leadership, there's no strife. You know, there are lots of equals. I'm not saying that it's perfect, but I'm saying if as a culture, we can start from that level, educate, educate. If every child, every girl child is given the right to be educated, not as a privilege, but as a human right, the difference we would see over time would be amazing. Well, I, I certainly will not be letting off my, uh, my colleagues, my male colleagues, mm. <laughs> off from this conversation. It'll be interesting to see what perspectives yeah. they bring into it. But, you know... I'm also looking and thinking again that, you know, sometimes all of this, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the term liberation, but oh. <laughs> um, when we talk about investing in women, accelerating oh. progress, it does come at a cost to society. Do you mm -hmm. think? Do mm -hmm. you think so? It does come at a cost, but it's a cost that we have to pay. Because if we don't pay that cost now, it will be due <laughs> in the future. We would, we would remain where we are and the progress is not complete. You cannot go with half yourself. Humanity is both male and female. We cannot succeed with half of ourselves. If we look at it to say we are both humans, we are. So it's, it's two sides of the same coin. So to complete the wholesomeness of us as a nation, we need to address. It's not about talking about it anymore. It's about taking positive action. And this is not just, this doesn't just sit with men, also sits with women. So I always say, make sure as a woman that you're looking at the girls that are coming behind you. You're looking at the woman that is sitting next to you. Because sometimes instead of waiting for men to wake up and, and smell the roses, we as women can be the change that we seek. Again, back to the power of one. Wherever you are, whatever platform you have, use it. Make sure that you're given the chance to another woman who is coming along. Make sure that you are leaving a legacy for your gender. Make sure that whatever you're doing, you bear in mind that it's not just about you, but you might be representing other women. That experience that that company or that group might have of you is going to tell the story of how they think about women. So 
bearing that in mind, we 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 go as a group, we go as a nation on our own, and we 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 make humans complete. And I think if we all take on that responsibility to say, if it is to be, is up to me, we've got this covered. That's a, you know, a really heavy responsibility for any woman to bear. The, 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 mm. the very knowledge that oftentimes when you walk into certain rooms, you're not just representing yourself, you're representing humanity, so to speak. Mm. You know, and mm. that how you carry yourself in a room in, you know, in, in any circumstance will be how women in general are perceived. Um, so it is, it is a really heavy responsibility. But when you think about the cost, I mean, we have made many developments in society. Let us not kid ourselves. We've come a long way from when a lot of women didn't go to school to oh. seeing many more women. In fact, in, I, I, yesterday was the conclusion of the call to bar um, the call to bar ceremony here in Abuja. The chairman of the body of benches is a woman, an accomplished justice of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, Justice Mary Odili. Uh, and I'm sure if we were to look at the figures, we don't have the breakdown now, but we most likely will see an equal division between men and women graduating as lawyers. So we have made some progress um, in, in many instances, but of course there is so much more ground to be covered. Um, I, I, I'm just wondering... You know, as a society, um, you know, what are some of the things that we've had to give and take? And do you think that on the long run, it has been worth it? Especially when you look at the, you know, the, the smallest units of society, the family. Hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm. You see, the, the family is the core of society. If, if the family breaks down, the society inevitably is broken down. And when you, when you think about our roles as women, we actually have the power to shape society because we have the power to shape our families. So let's not kid ourselves. Let's not um, get lost in the whole mantra that, oh, women are, are, are not being given a chance. So yes, that's all true. But like you're saying, a lot of progress has been made. So let's not, let's not run the script of yesteryears. Let's take account of where we are, how far we've come. Because sometimes we get lost in where we were, that we don't take stock of where we are. And you're very correct. There's been a lot of changes. There's been massive shifts in many industries. Let's celebrate that. And bearing that in mind, bring it down, like you're saying, to the core unit, which is the value in the family. As women, <laughs> we're not contending oh, when it comes to that. So if we get it right from that level, back to the power of war, back to if it's up to be, if it's to be, it's up to you. You have got the power to influence a couple of children in your home, a couple of staff in your home, your husband, your spouse, whatever the case might be. Are you using it positively? Are you aware of the opportunity of that platform? Are you aware that that is a platform? And if you are, what are you doing about it? What are you doing thinking about tomorrow, not just, okay, the next five years, what school is my kid going to go to, what, what, what are they going to become a this or a that? If we bring it down to that micro level, as women, we have the power of influence. Let's use it. I totally agree with you. I, well, thankfully, I um, <laughs> co-present this program with a very, very loud he for she's, and one of them is right there in Lagos. <laughs> Ayo, with the purple heart. <laughs> well, thank you. Incidentally, um, you know, you've asked quite a number of questions, Malpe, that all I just want to do is just follow up on some of them, um, really. So, well, Dr. Nakimio, good to know that at least there are shining lights all over the world, and thankfully, you know, you are privileged to be one. Let me start with the final point you made from Malpe's question about the role of parents. You know, sometimes the pressure is coming from home, from that micro level, because when we talk about all these uh, inflation rates, macroeconomic indices and everything, it all comes down to the price of bread price of tomatoes, price, price of corn in the market. And then there is usually that pressure from the home, from the mom or from the dad, that the girl child, in particular in most cases, should go and bring a husband. She, that, that pressure is, you know, is sometimes very, very daunting and overwhelming. 
So what kind of messaging should be, should, because it's one thing for the parents to tell you something because of the responsibilities that they have and the pressures that they themselves feel or brought themselves under. There's another um, issue of the girl child, the woman, the young lady, taking this messaging and owning it. What kind of messaging should this young lady, the potential woman of the future, be taking into her future from all of the issues that mommy or daddy may be raising today? That's an amazing question. Thank you for that. I think it's back to what we were saying before. There is a narrative in our culture where women are made to become somebody's wife. I appreciate that. Now, I can't do anything about that narrative. I can't personally change that narrative. However, going forward, that girl child who has been told that, who has been told that her value lies in her getting married, if she sees it differently, she has the power to be the change that she seeks. So my response to that would be, what's the different narrative that you want to tell? Because you are going to become a woman, you are going to run your own home, do you want to pass that culture on or do you want to change it? You see, that narrative of we're groomed to be married is back to the same thing where we're being subjected. So that whole narrative on its own needs to be changed. So for those of us who know better, can we change that narrative? Because as soon as we do, the conversation will change. So let's not focus on what it was. From here on, what is it going to be? And that's down to you and I. What are we doing in our own families right now, at this level, where we are, in our families? What are we saying to our children today? Are we carrying on with what was said to us? Or are we changing what we're saying to them? So I think if every girl child, every lady, every woman who's coming up, coming of age, focus on you. Who are you? Who are you and what are you offering? Yes, you've been told that this is what you're supposed to do. But do you know different? If you do know different, then be different. Okay. That's what I would say. Well, let's stick with messaging for a bit. Mm -hmm. A good number of them... Uh, young men, young women, they live on the internet, particularly those they call the netizens. They literally live online. They see all kinds of things. Uh, to a large extent, all over the world, I hear, the issues are the same. Economic uh, challenges, inflation figures, we haven't quite recovered from COVID. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any better anytime soon in any part of the world that anyone would go to. So what should they be looking for? Mm. It's one thing to get messaging from parents and all. I have seen uh, what you talked about, the, the theme of the celebration this year, to accelerate the progress. It's the individual himself or herself, well, in this case, herself, that should mm. be looking out for something. What would you recommend? that young ladies be looking for. Malpe took a news item this morning that widowhood cases on the front page of Nigeria's The Guardian newspaper, that widows, are some, some of them are as young as 23. Mm. Now, that's definitely not the kind of statistic that we want to live, but it's our reality. Mm. What kind of messaging should young women be looking for that will at least insulate them from mentally, from the vicissitudes that life will certainly bring? It's going to be the same thing, education, personal development. When we're young, we call it education. When we're old as adults, we say personal development. Educate yourself. Fortify yourself with information. We have information overload. Select what is important. If you can educate yourself as a young lady, the world is your oyster. The limits that we place on ourselves, based on our culture, based on our environment, they are real. However, the internet has given us access. You can, I'm, I'm here and I'm talking to you where you are. We're connected to three different locations connected via technology. Take advantage of technology. If you have access to it, use it wisely. Not just to be a consumer of, of information, but the potential you carry as a young woman is immense. 
Mm. Use it profitably. Think about yourself and those coming after you. If we shift away from the selfishness of me, myself, and I, and consider who we are as women and what we have to offer, we would use our time profitably. We would seek to be the change. We would seek opportunities. We would seek to be solutions. So the little thing that is around you, that, that litter that you found there, don't point at it, pick it up. Mm. It's just being the change that you seek. That would be what I would say. One more thing uh, from me. You know, we've talked about what the Nigerian needs to do, what the young lady needs to do, what the young woman needs to do, and all of that. But to accelerate this progress, one would need the influence of certain authority levels, government. And the route into government these days, if you're not a civil servant, is to get involved in democracy, active participation, be a member of a political party and all of that. But then you also know, I'm sure you are in touch with home enough to know sometimes the challenges that women have. So in terms of policy, in terms of inclusion, what would you suggest that the political parties factor into their uh, selection processes so that there can be more inclusion, if they are serious about it, so that there can be more inclusion in, uh, of, of women in particular, in uh, government-related instances. And this here is why. I've just been thinking that any time we are talking about our lives generally, there is hardly any mention of children these days. Mm. But guess what? That is the, that's the domain of women. They will think about their children first before they even think about their husbands or, 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 or even their own parents. So in order to be able to sustain development, consider the children, what would you suggest that the political parties be looking at, including women in the entire process, selection process, so that it can be, people can vote for them into elective offices? Very important question. You see, the female agenda is the human agenda. Female agenda is not about women. It is about humans. It is important that, yes, even though we, we can say what we want politicians to do, like I said earlier, if there are no women on that table, the narrative is still going to be one-sided. So as politicians, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you're doing, you are related to a woman one way or the other. If nothing else, a woman gave birth to. So if you don't have the, if they don't have the understanding of what it is to be female, bring in those who do know. And like I said before, as women, you're correct, we have to aspire, we have to aspire to go forward into political positions because in order to make the changes, lasting sustainable changes, women have to be in those positions as well. It's not going to be a, a man that will make the change that will favor a woman. Yes, we can have he, she's out there um, like yourself, but I would insist that it is important that we as women, we do our due diligence. Look up the rules, rules of engagement and join these political parties to see the lasting change that we see. Oh, good, Dr. Blessing. What would you consider as um, the one impediment to allowing this message resonate both among the male, even the female folk? <laughs> I would say the main thing is culture. It's how we've done it. It's how it is within organizations, within political parties, within industries. If we keep the narrative of this is how it's always done, why change it if we ain't broke? You know, and the, all that story of, it's a cultural thing. That's the main thing. But if we embrace change, and the change is difficult, but if we are change oriented and want to see something different, we're going to have to do something different. Oh, I certainly have to thank you. I mean, it gives us food for thought, our culture, you know, standing in the way. The culture is standing in the way of progress. I mean, we all learned that culture is <laughs> dynamic in primary school. Isn't that what we learned? Well, mm. we do hope that, you know, culture will continue to prove itself dynamic, especially mm. with regards to the second half of its 
or shall I say the equal half of its own population. Thank you so much for your thoughts this morning and for sharing them with us, Dr. Blessing and Akimo, CEO of the Blay Global and uh, Director of Events, Brevity Anderson, joining us from Kent in the United Kingdom. Thank you so much once more and happy International Women's Day to you. Thanks for having me. Have a lovely day, guys. And it turns out it happens to be on a Friday. Well, you always say, thank God it's Friday. Indeed. <laughs> well, good news, guys. The whole month is Women's Month. We will be celebrating. Say what? Yes. You know you have how many... How many no. Mothering Sundays this month? Oh, dear. <laughs> so whether or not you like it, we'll be dominating the space at least one month a year is not a bad idea, is it? Uh, we have to thank you so much for your time watching the program this morning. And special greetings once more to all the women out there doing great work. Let us continue to spare thought for those uh, who are coming behind and, you know, continue to raise our voices for what needs to be done for the whole of society to invest in women because it's the only way we can accelerate progress. Thank you for watching this beautiful Friday morning. I'm Mal Fuel for you, sir. I know society loves to progress. So um, whatever we can, do what you can so that we can all move forward because at the end of the day, we all will benefit from it. It's been a pleasure today as well. We look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, I'm Chain Balinusov. Goodbye. I spare a thought for men who are doing the, men, the women's work as well, single parents, men. Happy International Women's Day to you as well. Have a wonderful rest of your day and a lovely weekend. I'm Ayo Makinde.